Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Cowlins, naturopathic physician and former professor of naturopathic medicine in Portland, Oregon. And welcome back to the series on salutogenic terrain medicine, where I explore paradigms and ways of knowing in biology and medicine, including so-called natural medicines, in order to deepen our understanding of the human being and health and disease. Uh, please don't forget to share, like, or subscribe if you find this content valuable. <clears throat> and this is the sixth lecture in the series. Um, and I'd like to build upon what I was speaking about in the last lecture, and I'll put to a link to that lecture in the description below. <clears throat> so I've been exploring this idea of ways of knowing or modes of cognition and how specific ways of knowing give us knowledge of only certain dimensions and aspects of the world that we observe. Um, our current scientific and medical paradigm is largely centered on the application of only one of several possible ways of knowing, as I've been uh, alluding to. Uh, and I've been referring to this as the earth analytical, intellectual, or quantitative mode of cognition, uh, which gives us a knowledge of the spatial and physical dimensions of the human being. Um, this mode of cognition really is a cornerstone of modern science since the 16th century. It is grounded in what one might call the uh, onlooker consciousness, where we attempt to separate the observer, uh, the subject, from what is being observed, the object. Um, so-called basis of obje objective consciousness. Um, and this way of knowing really attempts to see our physical form, our life activities, and the activities related to mind and consciousness, all from the vantage point of matter. Uh, and it's epitomized in the reductionistic and mechanistic molecular and genetic models used in biomedicine. Um, but as I've argued, these same models are also increasingly being applied to so-called traditional, natural, functional, and integrative medicines. Um, this way of thinking has given us the pathogenic cellular model of disease based upon the metaphors of treatment of disease as warfare and the metaphor of the body as a machine, specifically a classical machine obeying the laws of classical physics and chemistry. Um, the current pharmacologic model of medicinal action, for example, is strongly influenced by this view. Uh, we study the solid molecules and how they move through the body and then largely based on their molecular shapes um, we look at how these molecules interact with the receptors and the machinery of the cell. Um, and our textbooks are really littered with diagrams of molecular action drawn from this perspective. We see these little almost billiard ball like molecules bouncing around and, and one stimulating another, but it has to be through usually direct contact or very close contact. Um, however, as I've argued in the last video, this way of knowing, although brilliant at capturing the structures of a human being, uh, all the way from molecules to the gross anatomy, um, can only study the products of life, and we can even say consciousness, uh, and fails to grasp life and consciousness processes in themselves. Life activities, for instance, uh, you know, uh, the processes of anabolism and catabolism, uh, growth and repair and reproduction, all of these work through molecules and genes. Um, but understanding the detailed structures of molecules and genes is insufficient to predict how life activities will unfold and how tissues and organs will ultimately shape themselves, a process known as morphogenesis. Um, in particular, I argued um, these uh, models and these ideas about uh, the molecular view of life is really based on a spatial consciousness, and uh, whereas life itself is actually working more through time and through temporal rhythms, for instance. Um, Again, life activities such as the growth and repair and whatnot that occurs in the, in the body, um, these processes have unique aspects and they're very different from what occurs in the mineral world. And one example I gave in the last lecture is the idea that living beings are able to create local pockets of decreased entropy or more order, a process known as negative entropy. Uh, and this rarely occurs in min the mineral realm where we have more closed systems. So you need an open system with a constant flow of energy to create a local pocket of entropy. Of course, a physicist would explain this by saying that, well, the total entropy always continues to increase. This is the so-called second law of thermodynamics, um, but it's at the expense of the environment. Whereas in the organism, uh, organisms maintain local order. Um, I gave the analogy a couple of lectures ago of reading a book. Um, how knowledge of letters or even words alone is insufficient to grasp the meaning of a book, which arises really at a higher level. Uh, the meaning works through the letters, words, paragraphs, chapters, uh, but it's not in any of them. Uh, and the same applies to life and consciousness. Life itself is not in the molecules. Consciousness is not in the dopamine and serotonin, but uses those 
um, those molecules as part of its activity. Although the Earth analytical quantitative way of knowing has given us tremendous advances in biology and medicine, I'm arguing that especially in acute, you know, these advances that we have, for example, in acute and trauma care, surgery, orthopedics, medical diagnostics, prosthetics, robotics, nanotechnology, etc., um, this view seems to be reaching a sort of limit in advancing our understanding of medicine. We don't really understand how to regenerate tissues, um, how to really activate the life activities. Uh, we can replace parts, but you know, how do you regenerate those parts? And these parts are normally, as part of a living organism, constantly regenerating. Uh, we seem to be at a loss as to how to effectively address the growing rate of chronic disease, including mental health disorders, from the, the mechanistic uh, paradigm. I also suggest that this way of knowing could be a factor behind some of the growing problems in medicine, such as increased reliance on pharmaceuticals, increased costs, over-specialization, even healthcare worker burnout. Um, the fix-it machine mentality has led to a never-ending game of clinical whack-a-mole, where we're really driven by symptom suppression, uh, although increasing with more and more precise, expensive, and targeted therapies. Proponents of so-called natural medicine, you know, we've, we've heard this argument before, argue that we need to move beyond just symptom suppression model and treat the cause. But the problem with this is it's, this is a very subtle issue. What do you really mean by a cause? If you're a geneticist, the cause is in the genome. If you're a molecular biologist, the cause is in a molecular pathway. Um, if you're a psychologist, the cause maybe is in the mind. So we have to look at, when we talk about causes, you have to be clear about the conceptual models you're using, the dimension or level of the human being you're describing, and the ways of knowing that those models are built upon. And a lot of times in natural medicine, we're not cognizant of the models we're using. Often we're just adopting, as I've said, the conventional biomedical understanding and applying that to use of natural products and therapies. And this is the reason why I'm diving so deeply into this, is to help us maybe deprogram or reprogram ourselves to include other uh, ways of knowing. As I discussed in the last lecture, we can use the ancient Greek concept of the four elements as representing four modes of knowing, each giving us knowledge of a different dimension of the human being. Um, this was really expanded upon by the work of the Austrian philosopher Rudolf Steiner in the late 18, early 1900s, and he himself based uh, a lot of his early work on the uh, work of the German poet Goethe. Goethe really attempted at his time uh, to develop a more organic and participatory type of consciousness uh, to use in sciences, the natural, natural sciences, as opposed to what he perceived to be the more analytical uh, intellectual models that were developing at, at that time in the late 1700s. In summary, the four modes that I've been speaking about here are the earth, solid, intellectual, analytical, which I just spoke about, and that allows us to perceive the physical level of organization in the human being. The water fluid imaginative synthetic consciousness would allow us to see the fluidic level of organization to perceive this more clearly. The air gas inspirative or feeling consciousness allows for the perception of what we might call an air gas inner light or consciousness body. Uh, and then finally a fire warmth, more intuitive, heart-centered, poetic consciousness allows for perception of one, what one might call the warmth organization. So these four levels of organization, physical, fluidic, gaseous, warmth, really are four dimensions of the human being, which I argue to have a complete salutogenic or integrative medicine requires that we bring all of these four together and, and discuss them. So in the last lecture, I began a discussion of the physical and the fluidic organizations. I looked deeply at sort of some of the laws of the physical, and these are, again, this is very familiar to anybody in modern healthcare, how cells work, how the physiologic mechanisms work. I won't go into that here. But I, I jumped to the second level organization and began discussing the fluid or fluidic organization. And I brought in the research of two particular researchers, Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington, a, bio, um, a biomedical engineer, and his uh, work with the fact that water in organisms is highly structured through hydrogen bonding. It's highly structured around so-called hydrophilic uh, surfaces. And those include the majority of the proteins within the cell, also collagen in the extracellular matrix. And uh, this water, what he calls exclusion zone or easy water, really extends far beyond the boundaries of that protein um, and excludes ions and takes on all sorts of unique and anomalous properties. Um, he refers to this really as a fourth phase of water. It's a liquid crystal phase, not solid, not liquid, but in between. 
Um, and in this phase, water can, for example, store negative electrical charge. This causes charge separation between easy water, structured water, and the so-called bulk or surrounding water, the unstructured water. So we can develop what he calls a water battery. If you put electrodes across this gap, you can create a current. And uh, he's gone in his books, I mentioned a couple of them, cells, gels, and the engines of life, and then the fourth phase of water, um, and how our physiology is really driven by these charge separations through the easy water. And so it's much more than just having ATP for energy, you need structured water. In fact, uh, his research has shown that ATP is used to form structured water. And then also things like infrared light from the environment is able to structure, create more of these water structures. And uh, so very important um, sort of uh, insight into how it's, you know, life, the energy that drives life is not just chemical in a molecule, it actually has to do with the water element, which we typically leave out in our discussions about proteins and, and everything else in biochemistry. Now, the second researcher I spoke about was Mei Wan Ho, who died in 19, uh, 2016, and she really looked at this idea that this, the organisms with the structured water within them are essentially quantum coherent and that idea of you know, quantum chemistry being applicable to life. That life itself is based on a condition of quantum coherence, and when there's coherence in the tissues where all of the particles of matter is essentially in sync, vibrating together, they're connected in this way, um, then we have the capacity for energy storage, but also rapid, almost instantaneous, and 100% efficient transfer of energy and information. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this would be much faster than the typical electrochemical pathways of nerves, for example, nerve impulses, and, or the flow of hormones to the body and so forth. So these, this near instantaneous communication in quantum coherent water uh, was something that Mei Wanho studied, and particularly how, for example, a proton can be channeled down a chain of water aligned along collagen, for example, um, and that when it's moving through that through that chain of collagen, the water, uh, the proton is essentially delocalized. It's spread out energetically throughout that entire structure. And so we have to start talking more about probability waves, probabilistically, where might you find that proton at any moment? Um, but basically the idea being that, you know, these uh, in water, the water body, it allows for a whole different type of lawfulness uh, to occur. Um, of course, um, I mentioned also that since her time or, or since the early research she did in the 80s and the 90s, there's been a fairly amount of extensive research now in so-called quantum biology in professional academic circles, and there are departments of quantum biology as well. Um, and this is the discovery, really, that there are quantum mechanical effects at the macroscopic and not just microscopic level, as a lot of people had assumed for a long time. And again, I'm using this, this word quantum here different than a lot of people talking about quantum consciousness and things like that. That's a whole separate topic. But basically this is quantum chemistry, that the quantum mechanical effects, for example, delocalization, um, uh, tunneling and coherence, these ideas which usually apply on the subatomic level have now been observed in living organisms to apply to large groupings of molecules perhaps even cells and perhaps even organs, that all the cells in an organ are quantumly coherent. Not a lot, it's, that's very, very difficult to measure, and so there's not a lot of scientific evidence for that, but that is an extension of that same way of thinking. Again, and that requires the structured water within all of those cells. A um, couple of areas, photosynthesis is one area where this, uh, we, we find quantum phenomena occurring when light hits the so-called antenna complex around chlorophyll. Um, there's a quantum mechanical effect that occurs there. And then olfaction, where we have smell receptors in our nose. For a long time, it was believed that molecules, scent molecules would float up there and then bind like a lock and key into a particular smell receptor. Well, there's a posing theory, which is still controversial, but there's evidence building for it, that essentially uh, it's the receptors in the nose are not measuring are not being bound lock and key by these molecules. They're measuring the vibrational modes or frequencies of the molecules coming in and there's a resonance transfer of energy. So this idea is extremely important, the resonance transfer of energy. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a moment here. So what, what Mei Wan Ho's work is suggesting is that we take the fluid body into consideration, the liquid crystalline body. We can't talk about the human being being a classical machine. Um, but rather we have to see ourselves as a quantum liquid crystal. 
Um, and this is not limited by the usual classical laws of classical physics and chemistry. So it opens up the door to a whole new set of laws working at the fluidic level that are not working at the material solid level. Um, so these quantum laws of like delocalization, quantum entanglement, but in particular the resonance transfer of energy where uh, two molecules that have chemical bonding in them, those bonds are vibrating, if they're excited, they vibrate at similar frequencies. These molecules can now exchange energy instantaneously across a distance, usually across water, organized water molecules, and um, that we can essentially start to look at you know, delivering therapeutic information to the body, not through molecules, but through their vibrational frequencies. Um, if you've studied organic chemistry, you, you see in spectroscopy, every compound has this unique spectra, and that corresponds to the vibrational modes of its bonds and the electron shells. And uh, so that energy, that, that information can be transferred potentially through these quantum coherent water structures. And so to pass information in this way, it doesn't require direct contact like it does in the classical physics. Um, and this would suggest really an entirely new pharmacologic model uh, based on the resonance transfer of energy, that molecules are transferring vibrational frequencies, again, um, from their chemical bonds uh, within them, and um, that these frequencies hold information about the remedial effects of the remedy, um, and that these, this information could be transferred relatively long distances through water structures, maybe uh, water hydrated collagen, for example, and that these frequencies would induce therapeutic change in, in the organism. So this is very different than the idea that you have to get a molecule, cross the gut barrier, into the blood, physically into the tissues. This would say that even, you know, the molecule just being sensed or detected by the um, sensory apparatus in the gut wall. That could be microvilli or many other different mechanisms with the so-called enteric nervous system that we can sense are the molecules we bring in, sense the compounds, and that information through their vibrational modes can be translated into the body and maybe flow through water channels uh, and then that can act as sort of an intracellular, body-wide intracellular communication network. This is speculative, but there are many that are suggesting that, that based on the work of Mei Wan Ho and many others, that this is certainly within the realm of possibility. Now that is applying more of a scientific earth-based thinking to the water body. How did traditional medicines understand the fluid or water body? I would really argue that if we study closely uh, Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine, uh, Ayurveda, uh, ancient Greek medicine, which actually has a remnant now in what's called Unani medicine in Persia, uh, Persian medicine, um, that these uh, medicines essentially are, are referred to as humoral medicines commonly. Um, they are really based in water fluidic cognition. And uh, so to understand them, we can't use our earth-based thinking. We have to jump to a water fluidic cognition to really grasp them. And they were referring to higher order activities working through that fluid body. That, that, that's my hypothesis here. Really the humoral medicines emphasize qualitative synthetic thinking. So they looked at, for example, polarities. We have the famous yin-yang polarity in Chinese medicine, um, and then elements as sort of archetypal processes in nature. Um, which in the elements had specific qualities. So for example, um, we have qualities of, for example, dryness, which refers to matter that is not bound up with the water uh, phase and essentially can't carry life activity uh, versus moist, which is matter bound up with the life potential for life activity. Um, and uh, that would be the quality of moisture. Cold indicates more of a contraction, more almost like under the influence of gravity and then warmth, more expansion, kind of a levity activity happening there. So then uh, elements were described in terms of usually two qualities in the ancient Greek way of thinking. Earth was cold and dry. Um, now it's interesting to think about earth cognition being cold and dry, lifeless and essentially rigid in this way, uh, very heavy in this thinking. And that's kind of the feeling one actually gets reading lots of textbooks written in detail from this perspective. It, it has a drying, desiccating kind of effect on consciousness. Um, and that is, again, really the hallmark of Western consciousness since the 16th century. Um, I would argue that you know, incorporating some of these other modes of knowing will help us enliven those dry, dead ways of thinking. In ancient Greece, these higher order processes were perceived as what they call the humors, the four humors. There's a similar idea in classical Chinese medicine, the so-called five phases, often translated as five elements. I would say maybe mistranslated. The actual 
uh, word uh, is Wu Xing, which is which is five uh, phases, or even maybe extending that to five rhythms, five activities, not static elements, um, and that essentially. These, these in the Greek system of thinking, the four humors, they, they call them black bile, phlegm, blood, and yellow bile, that health really corresponded to a state of balance of these humors. And the humors are really uh, pictures of the four elements, earth, water, air, fire, inside living organisms. And so a state of health would be eucrasia, where there'd be a balance of those humors, and then dyscrasia would be disease, uh, where there's an imbalance of the humors. And the role of medicine really is to rebalance the humors. Um, and this formed the basis of medicine for nearly 2,000 years in the West. Um, a very important concept that went along with the humors is that these were not seen to be just like mineral earthly forces or what were called telluric forces. They were thought to actually originate from the cosmos, come into the earth. Um, and this gave rise to the idea of vitalism, that life has some properties different from the mineral world, laws that are different from the mineral world. Uh, and that this, uh, these so-called vital or vital forces really drove life activities. Um, and that they were somewhat super sensory or spirit-like in origin. They were not material in this way. Very similar ideas in China and India with qi and prana, although I'll come back to those because, you know, this idea of qi and prana also brings in an air, not just a fluidic uh, aspect. Um, there was thoughts in ancient Greece to be an intelligence within organisms that uh, kept the humors balanced. And uh, as long as any sort of obstacles uh, to their proper functioning were, were you know, not there, were removed, these forces would rebalance the terrain of an organism. And they called these the vis medicatrix naturae, the healing power of nature. Um, so the vis was thought to work through the vital principles and it could be stimulated with different therapeutic measures, with uh, remedies and diets, hydrotherapy, and, and these sorts of things. Um, and this is really the, the origin of the salutogenic terrain idea. The terrain would be the four humors, and the idea that we rebalance humors and not so much focus on disease, an actual entity of disease. You balance the humors, and then the disease process can't exist in that soil or terrain of the organism. Uh, there were similar humoral ideas in, in North America, for example, all the way up into the end of the uh, 1800s. I'll just mention here the School of Physiomedicalism. Uh, the brilliant writer and herbalist Matthew Wood has written extensively about this, and I'll link uh, below in the description some of his works. Um, but basically, uh, Matthew Wood described the idea of the physiomedicalists. Really, they worked with what they call tissue states, and this is a very ancient idea. We see this also in Ayurveda in Chinese medicine. The idea that um, in illness states, people take on different characteristic states in their tissue that we can describe using the qualities of hot and cold, dry and damp, and then uh, uh, the physiomedicalist added a third polarity, and that would be tense or relaxed, uh, cor uh, corresponding to the activity of the nervous system. So we can start to group people into are they hot or cold, dry, more dry or damp, intense and relaxed. And to perceive these qualities, you can't do a simple measurement. You have to feel the pulse, look at the tongue, take the history, look at the complexion and the whole body type. So it involves higher order senses that need to be cultivated, very different than the intellectual kind of mechanical senses that we typically uh, educate medical students in today. Um, these kinds of qualitative thinking can be cultivated with a lot of practice, and that's what's done often in, in the schools of Chinese medicine currently. Um, but, you know, I'm arguing that we can bring this into more of a modern biomedical setting as well. Um, so, for example, a hot, irritated tissue state would be one with a lot of redness, uh, a lot of uh, flushing, maybe fever, uh, inflammation, those sorts of things, rapid pulse. They would all be thing qualities that would give us that idea of a tense tissue state and then treatment is aimed at cooling and relaxing that hot tense tissue state so then remedies are classified based on their actions this way so again very different than a molecular thinking which thinks of antioxidants anti-inflammatories and whatnot uh, we would think of you know uh, the qualities of remedies in this way um, now this is an important point which often i think is overlooked um, you know the uh the uh the idea of humors really started falling out of favor, especially by the mid 1850s in, in Europe. Uh, and we can say that really what started happening is that starting in the 1500s, 1600s, more and more earth consciousness was brought to bear on the human beings. So the humors were gradually looked at as being physical things. 
not some sort of supersensory humors or activities or processes, but as things. And so to balance the humors, you would do things like actually bleeding, get the black bile out or purging. Uh, so that we get the, the humors out. And so we have these horrendous stories of people essentially dying from the therapies. And uh, so most people kind of look at the four humors with, with a little smirk and they're like, well, this, is, this was an outdated way of thinking. But really what happened was that people's consciousness shifted and instead of looking at the humors in the original sense, as what the ancients did, they essentially began to look at them as more physical things uh, that had to be addressed. By the 1850s, the physician Rudolf Virchow really came up with the cellular theory of disease, as I've spoken about before, and that replaced humorism and began, and also vitalism, and it said, really, we don't need humors or vital forces, we just need the cell and understanding of the chemistry of the cell. And then through that chemical understanding, mechanical understanding, we can essentially understand how to treat disease. Uh, currently, uh, you know, the, from Virchow's time on, that just developed into molecular biology and genetics and our current medical model. If you now mention vitalism in the vis medicatrix in sort of more academic or medical circles, it's usually met with ridicule. And if you read the entries in Wikipedia, for example, sort of a standard of the kind of, uh, say, the earth-based paradigm view of the world, um, that they, they, they essentially say this is an outdated pseudoscientific idea that has no merit, and that schools such as naturopathy, which still mention the vis medicatrix, uh, really are pseudoscientific and we should do away with them. Um, unfortunately, even in naturopathic schools, I have found as a professor there that many say terms like the vis medicatrix support the vis medicatrix and whatnot, but they don't understand what that means uh, in a modern context. They learn everything from the perspective of the earth-based thinking, molecular biology and whatnot. So how that relates to the vis, no one really knows. It's more just a sort of talking point at this point without a lot of substance. But um, I would argue that actually there's a lot of substance there that we can look at if we take it take a different viewpoint. You know, humorism in the vis, interestingly, didn't really die in biomedicine. It wasn't really expunged from medicine. It took on a different form. And that was the, uh, the French physiologist, the so-called father of physiology, Claude Bernard, reformulated the exact same idea of the humors, and he called this the milieu interior, that we have to maintain an internal state in the face of changing outer environmental conditions, change in heat and temp, you know, uh, 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 moisture and all this, we have to keep our own inner environments. All of the different you know, glucose and the proteins have to be kept within the certain boundaries. And so this was the milieu anterior or internal terrain. He actually borrowed this, this idea from a physician, Charles Robin, who used it as a synonym, synonym for the, the vis medicatrix and the four humor. So really the four humor idea just got incorporated into milieu anterior. And then uh, that later inspired others like Walter Cannon in the early 1900s, an American physiologist, to formulate the idea of homeostasis. And then we worked out the details of homeostasis in the, you know, how it's regulated by the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the immune system, and how psychology plays in with that as well. We have so-called psychoneuroendocrine immunology. Um, but this is all, you know, starting with Bernard and Cannon and whatnot, they still, they were mechanists. So they thought, yes, they thought in terms of uh, internal terrain, but they thought that the forces were not vital, they were mechanical. And we can use, for example, uh, what are called cybernetic algorithms for understanding feedback loops for how hormones regulate. Everyone is familiar with the idea of the hypothalamus in the brain sort of being a thermostat for the body and how a thermostat works. If things get warmer, thermostat senses this, turns things down, turns the temperature down, and so forth. So this is uh, based on cybernetic loops and a lot of and, and modern computer science actually was born out of a study of physiology, uh, interestingly, with, um, with how they developed the thinking from, from early computers in the 40s and the 50s. So this idea uh, of, uh, of the vis medicatrix really just became incorporated in the modern idea of homeostasis. Now we have the concepts of so-called allostasis and homeodynamics, which are related to that. Um, now, at the time, in the early 1900s, middle 1900s, some took the idea of milieu anterior a little differently. And they, looked, they really began to look at what is the internal soil? Uh, instead of just the hormones and the nervous system, where does everything play out? Uh, and one particular player here, one, a researcher here, was uh, Alfred, uh, uh, Alfred Pischinger. And Pischinger, I, I'll put a link to his book below, or one of his books, The Matrix and Matrix Revolu Re Regulation. 
um, he studied the extracellular matrix and the so-called ground substance, which is essentially organized water uh, around proteins in the extracellular matrix and how that regulates cell function. And if you look at the matrix in any tissue, there are nerve endings, blood vessels, and then coming in and then blood vessels and lymph going out. And so the matrix really is connected to the whole body through the nervous system and the circulatory system. Um, and then it in itself regulates the cell. Um, and I'll have more to say about that in, the, in future lectures, but that's again this idea of the matrix regulating. And so begs the question, what is the fundamental unit of life? Is it really the cell or is it the cell and its matrix all taken as a unit? So that was Pischinger's work, which kind of was ignored basically, but it was based on essentially extending the milieu anterior idea even further. Today, Pischinger's ideas do still live in more manual therapy, uh, massage therapy, physical medicine, looking at the fascia and how fascia functions and whatnot. So there is still representations of that, but not so much within the traditional or academic medical circles. Um, but there's a deeper question here. You know, um, vitalism really, we say, has been replaced by mechanism. But now that we understand the nature of exclusion zone water, structured water within the body and the cell and the matrix, um, and how that these water structures allow for not just classical physical chemistry to arise, but also for quantum effects, uh, resonance transfer of energy and quantum coherence in particular. And these rules are very different than classical rules. Um, could it be that what the ancients were talking about as intuiting as vital forces really were these quantum level effects in the water structures uh, working through easy water. So this would be sort of a new vitalism, uh, but the difference being that we actually don't think that they're spiritual or supersensory, that they're actually governed by the laws of physics. Just we have to apply not classical physics, but quantum physics to understand uh, it's the so-called vital concept and what happens in life activities. So that's going to be my closing point here in a sort of a point of thinking. Um, basically, this question of is vitalism reborn, essentially, through an understanding of the quantum mechanical nature of structured water and the activities that go on there, and that what people qualitatively have observed as the flow of, for example, chi or prana, uh, in traditional medicines really are describing quantum level type events occurring through the water structures uh, in the fascia and in the tissues in general. All right, so in summary, the fluid organization has been extensively studied uh, by traditional medicines, uh, and that was really the basis of traditional humoral medicines was the fluid organization rather as opposed to the earth or physical organization, which is why if we study traditional medicines, we can't just use earth thinking. We have to, we have to broaden our thinking to understand them. Um, we have humoral medicines represented right up in, into the end of the 1800s with the physiomedicalists and the early naturopaths. Modern naturopathy has really moved away from that, again, has adopted more of a uh, the biomedical earth-based thinking model. Um, the fluid organization really is, we have to think of it as a liquid crystal. Um, and from this, as I've alluded to in previous lectures, especially if we look at embryological development, the physical organism precipitates. So essentially the liquid crystal body is there first and then the physical body precipitates from it. And that's what I spoke about earlier is when we use physical earth-based thinking, we're only seeing what has come out of life Life is happening in that liquid crystalline body as rhythms and process, quantum processes, and then falls out into the physical. And then we study those pieces and we try to put them together mechanically, but we're not studying life anymore. We're studying a corpse. Um, so this is uh, what Goethe, going back to Goethe again, he really said we, our, our science should stick with the processes of life um, and understand that when we analyze these pieces, we're really looking at corpses, not the actual life process. Um, it's again, you know, really tantalizing now to connect this idea of vitalism with these new discoveries and say that flow of information and energy through tissues uh, understood now on the basis of quantum mechanical laws is what the ancients might have described as, as vital forces. But unlike the old notion that they're somehow super sensory and mystical, that these are actually physical phenomena, but we just have to extend and use a different physics. Uh, broaden our, our understanding of physics in organisms. So we have to apply a quantum biophysics to life to really get to this deeper understanding. Um, 
Now it gets even more interesting when you realize that when you have quantum coherent domains in the body, then we have all sorts of interesting electromagnetic and light phenomena that can occur in physiology. And that's coming up. I'm going to have a lecture on that here. And that'd be part of our air and light organization, which rides on top of the water in and has a regulatory effect on the water body itself, which then regulates the physical. Um, before jumping there though, I'm going to spend one more lecture on the fluid organization and I want to bring in the ideas of Rudolf Steiner and what he said about the fluid organization. He gave it a specific name. He called it the etheric body based on older teachings uh, and the idea of etheric formative forces. Uh, and the etheric field, which is a type of field he described as very different from the typical physical field studied in, in classical physics, such as um, electromagnetic or gravitational fields. These etheric fields more have a quantum-like uh, property. So uh, that will be in the next lecture. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. All right, well, that'll wrap it up for this one. As always, if you find this content valuable, please share, like, and subscribe to the channel. And uh, I really appreciate and thank you for watching.